Welcome to the dealer education class today. Um, thank you for being here. We know you had a choice on where to get your education today. Um, the association has been around for a long time. It was officially organized in 1975, if you can believe that. That seems like an e eternity ago. Uh, we just completed our 40th year of management of the association, if you can believe that. This is our 40th session. We've been on Capitol Hill representing car dealers, power sport, and RV dealers. And that's really important for you to have a voice on Capitol Hill. Um, one of the reasons why we have education program is exactly that, is so you know what went on on Capitol Hill during the day and, and during the session, and also what happens all year long, okay? So um, we appreciate you being here. Um, after you complete this class, um, the state will receive the information from us that you took this class. So you should be able to do your uh, renewal online and get that taken care of. So everybody should have a handout uh, that you got when you came in the door. Uh, we're gonna go through this and uh, talk about a few things that went on this year that were exciting and some that weren't exciting at the Capitol. And we're also gonna talk to you about action items that you need to do. And so now we know we have a bill, what do we need to do about it, okay? If you open up the front page of that, that's our uh, association page and why we have an association. It's interesting that the legislature almost every year without fail asks me, well, who are your members? Because every year we have new members of the legislature, okay? And in fact, this year there are gonna be 18 new members on Capitol Hill, House and Senate members. That's huge, that's a lot. That's about 20% of our House and Senate up there that are gonna have new representatives that represent you. And so what we are as an association is to go help educate them on what goes on in a dealership and when they wanna do something legislatively, we let them know that, hey, that's a great idea, this helps dealers, or, and usually the case is, that's not very good. Or let's restructure this language so that it does work for the industry but still provide the protection that you want as a legislator, okay? So if you take your book on the next page is a table of contents. In that table of contents, if you have questions, which I figure you will, because every year we have people call back and say, hey, I didn't quite get this part and what I need to do, make sure that you uh, refer to the table of contents, look that up, but call me and I'll probably reference you back to this, but we're here to happy to answer your questions, okay? We'd like to have all of you who call us be members. Um, our national attorney, he, uh, he treats us pretty well because we have some issues in here on some federal issues and he's happy to help every one of you his first question to you, however, is gonna be, are you a member of the association? And if you say, well, I'm not yet, or I'm gonna be, or whatever, but if you're not an active, or a, a, a paid member of the association, he's gonna say, if you're gonna ask a question, make sure it's a good one, because you only get one. On the second one, you have to join, okay? So anyway, um, the uh, table of contents, we will help you through and help you understand. On the next page is, uh, we all know that titling, is a huge part of your business and problematic at times. As many years as you've been doing title work, every once in a while somebody will throw you a curve, right? Because things change, out of state titles, all different kinds of things change. We're here to help you. We have three locations here in the state of Utah, uh, one here in Midvale, one in Ogden, one in Orem. And our title clerks are absolutely the best in the state. They have the fewest errors of any title. In fact, typically we don't have any errors on the processing that we do. So those of you who don't know, we do t uh, process title work just like a regular DMV office. And uh, I know there's a number of you that use us. The money that we actually charge you for that goes to doing the things that we do on Capitol Hill. We can't do it dues alone. And so we appreciate that you're investing in your industry and also being able to help yourself with that. On the next page is the uh, license education program. Let me just say something about that because we're about in our 20th year, if you can believe it, of having dealer education. I think it's 18 or 19, closing in on 20 quickly. And that's been a lot. One of the things that we have seen very dramatically change with education as it was instigated is the number of DMV complaints and the number of failure to deliver titles has decreased consistently through that uh, 18 to 20 year time period. We know that the education works because it does two things. One, it helps keep you in compliance. And two, you can educate your customer on things that are coming in. And when they have questions, you're informed, you're educated, and you know exactly what you should be telling them. There's always a lot of uh, misinformation out there as it relates to our industry, because at times it's very complicated. So we wanna make sure that the public has trust and confidence in you that when they wanna buy a used car, they come to the members of the association. The other thing that I'll say is that we're not attorneys here. 
I deal with the law almost on a daily basis, but I'm not an attorney. I don't want to be, okay? But uh, some of these things are going to apply to your business, and some of them aren't. We suggest that you uh, seek legal counsel if you don't have an attorney that knows anything about the car business. We have a couple that we use that are very good that we refer dealers to to handle some of those <clears throat> excuse me, some of those issues that uh, may be unique to your business. The last thing I'll mention on this page is that one of the purposes of us being on Capitol Hill, to, Capitol Hill as well is to avoid any unfair legislation or things that are, gonna, that are not needed. A lot of times legislators say, hey, we ought to do this or we ought to do that. And we, and we go back and help educate them as to why we should or shouldn't be doing those things. We have, my philosophy is we should pass one bill if we're gonna repeal two others. You know, less is better. But let's make sure, and the purpose of legislation is to create an even playing field for everybody to work from. That, that's what our purpose is. On the next page is our antitrust statement. Anytime we get competitors together, uh, we wanna make sure that everybody understands that we don't talk about things that are of an antitrust nature. Those include price fixing, boycotting, those sorts of things uh, that we uh, do not uh, participate in. The next page is on our copyright issues. We want to make sure that you understand uh, that we have certain forms and things that are copyrighted. We ask you not to copy those. It's always an unpleasant day for me if I have to call a printer or a dealer and say, hey, there's a problem, you're using our forms that are not authorized. Copyright laws are very specific. So make sure, and it doesn't mean you can't have somebody else print our forms if you like. You just have to have our permission to do that. So make sure you let us know. Okay, uh, we're gonna get into the meat of the uh, bills that were passed this year. I started those on, on page one, uh, that at the top of the page says motor vehicle legislation. Anybody wanna take a guess at how many bills were passed this year in the session? 533 new bills or amended bills, amended sections of the code, okay? That's a lot considering there were over 1,200 bills that were actually numbered and probably closer to 1,400 of bills that were actually wanting to be heard. The legislature meets for 45 days. They never meet on Saturdays and Sundays. That means they have about 30 to 31 working days, okay? In 30 to 31 days, they pass 533 bills. Do you think they have time to read them all? No. That's why they rely on associations like ours to be able to tell them when they have an issue concerning motor vehicle, they call me or they come to me in the hallway and say, hey, Wayne, what do you think about this? Here's this new, or I want to do this. A lot of times that happens well before the session. I'll have a legislator call me in the summertime and said, hey, I had a constituent that had this experience. It may have been a good one, but more than likely it wasn't a good one because a lot of the legislation that comes up is because dealers aren't following the protocol and the law that they're supposed to be and haven't treated that customer right. So we try to go back and fix that with the legislator and also their constituent. So that's important for us to make sure when we do things in our dealership, you never know who that person is. They may, they may be very active with their legislator and, and voting for them and know who they are. And if they have a complaint, they're gonna go to them. That's where a lot of the legislation comes from that we have that affect car dealers. So make sure you understand that. Um, I will also say on, these, on all these bills in your handout, we put an implementation date. There are typically three or four different implementation dates. Most of the implementation dates are May 8th. The reason it's May 8th is because that's 60 days following the session. If there's no specific date on the bill, that's the implementation date. So on May 8th, you'll hear on the news that, you know, 387 or whatever the number of new bills went into, um, came into law that day, okay, that's why. Sometimes they'll have a specific implementation date like January 1 or October or whatever. We'll reference those as we go through so you know exactly when they go into play. Which falls right into this first bill. This first bill goes into, um, into effect on January 1 and uh, that should be actually January 1 of 2019. I'm sorry, that's a typo in there if it's in yours is 18. But it goes into effect this January 1st. January 1st, this is a bill that we actually took to the legislature that deals with motorhomes. Uh, the, particularly the RV Association has had a lot of problems with property tax payments over the years. And also I found out there's a lot of used car dealers that take motorhomes in on trade that get stuck owing property taxes on those motorhomes. When you have a motorhome come in, you could actually have property taxes that are due for the current year, like right now for 2018, as well as 2017, and you could trade that in and do your deal. You go around, turn around, and sell it to somebody else. Now you got property taxes for two years that you didn't know about. Well, that just killed your bottom line pretty hard, didn't it? 
Okay, so this is a bill we took up there, and basically what we did is, if you remember the history of automobiles, we did an age-based fee on cars and light-duty trucks in, in about 1994, okay? So that we had an age-based fee instead of a value based on the value of the vehicle, it's now based on age. So every three model years, it's a different amount. Same way on motorcycles, ATVs, snowmobiles, travel trailers, we did all those in 2003. <clears throat> The three categories that were remaining were houseboats, which I don't think will ever change. Uh, two is the special equipment, such as cherry pickers, tankers, that sort of thing, because they're so vast and broad. But motorhomes seem to make sense. So this year, we took this bill up here, and you'll see right in the middle of the page, there's a new chart for motorhomes. That chart shows the age-based fee. In, in, in the legislation part, the way it la lay it out, it's, it, if it was me, I'd put the more frequent ones on the top. But in this case, if the vehicle is less than uh, three model years, so current plus one, two, so three total, the property taxes are going to be $690. We don't have to go through that onerous, complicated um, calculation before to figure out the value, the MSRP times a good percent of goods value times the tax rate equals what the taxes do. Okay, and then if it's oh, two years taxes, then it's a different chart and so forth. This means that motorhomes are gonna be licensed and registered and those taxes are gonna be paid every time that motorhome is registered, just like a vehicle, okay? So if you have a motorhome, it's not necessary for you to go through and check to see if the property taxes are paid. Just understand when you resell it, here's the chart of the amount that it's due. We had to make sure that this bill came out revenue neutral, that's how those numbers came up. Okay, that there are on each one of those categories, and it comes up actually up with uh, with being revenue neutral. So again, this is at the time of registration. The other thing I'd like to tell you again is that this doesn't go into effect until January 1st of 19. Okay, and because of that, we're still going to have to deal with the old motorhome system between now and January. If you go and license any motorhomes at the DMV, okay and you have a problem with that, call me. I will get that fixed. We have already talked with the tax commission on this rather extensively. We've told them about some existing problems that are happening between certain branches that keep rearing their head of not doing that process correctly. If you, if you have a problem, don't do battle on your own. Just call me and say, Wayne, this office, we've had a problem. This is what it is. Can you help us? The answer is yes. I can make a phone call and get it taken care of that day. Okay? Any questions on that? And feel free to ask questions as we go along because your neighbor probably has the same question. On the next uh, bottom of page two is, um, is House Bill 411. This is a franchise bill for mostly for franchise dealers, but does affect the, the used car side as well. This has to do with safety recalls, do not drive uh, orders, and stop orders. What happens is with them, when a manufacturer sends vehicles to a new car dealer, Sometimes they will put it, they'll send them all these cars and then they'll send them a stop order that says, oh, sorry, you can't sell this vehicle because now that it's been stopped. You know, you can't sell it because of safety recall. And all those definitions are in here. If that's the case, what this bill does is it does a couple things. It puts in the Franchise Act some prohibitive things that the manufacturer can't do. So if the manufacturer says, hey, stop doing that, the dealer's still paying flooring, paying flooring and inventory and all the things that he has to, this allows the dealer to be able to charge the manufacturer for that. So in the prohibitive acts, it also pr precludes the manufacturer that talks about through page three, is it prohibits things that the manufacturer can't do. So we didn't want the manufacturer to go back and say, well, we gotta pay for all this stuff, so we're gonna uh, uh, reduce incentive programs or we're gonna charge them somewhere else. We put all that, all that in as a preventative measure. <clears throat> we actually uh, put into place um, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. We also put into place on this, if you look at the bottom of page four in the about third, in paragraph 10A, it says, within, and this is the part that the manufacturer has to reimburse the dealer for having to hold those cars. So paragraph 10A on the bottom of page four says, if within 30 days after the day on which the uh, franchise or, meaning the manufacturer, issues an initial notice, um, uh, to recall or part or remedy is not reasonably available to perform the recall repair on a used motor vehicle each calendar month thereafter, and this is each calendar month, the franchisor shall pay the franchisee an amount equal to at least 1.35% of the used value of that vehicle. 
So what happens is that vehicle sits there. If it's going to sit there for six months, it's going to depreciate in value. The manufacturer is going to have to compensate the dealer for that. If, in fact, and the rest of it starts going through about if the manufacturer fixes that, then that stops. If there's now parts available, whatever the case may be. It also gives another remedy for a car dealer through that if it doesn't happen through the franchise law, they can take individual action through the courts if they so choose. Okay, I didn't understand your question. Well, motorhomes are taxed as, pro as property as if they were a home. Right, well, they're not really actually they're not. They're taxed as personal property, okay? And in fact, the tax on that is, it's still considered a motor vehicle, so that's not correct. It's still taxed like a car, but it's done on the value rather than an age. That's what we changed on the motorhome bill. Okay, so it's not like a home. It's a different type of tax, totally different type of tax. And it's now age-based based on that model. Okay, um, so that takes us through uh, page seven for the, let me just make sure, excuse me, excuse me, to page six. The next bill, uh, somebody asked me coming in, hey, is there a Tesla bill this year? I wouldn't be here without Tesla, right? Talk about that, here we go. Hopefully this is last time, but that's a hopeful statement, right? Stephen, how many times have we heard this, right? Too many probably. <laughs> Um, so on page six, it talks about th uh, House Bill 369. This is an auto dealership licensing bill. I'm not going to go through this in great detail. There's a couple of things I'm going to mention, but basically what the legislature did in working with the different associations is to do a specific carve out for Tesla. And how that was done, it's very restrictive, very narrow, and what it does is create a new licensure. Okay, the new licensure right on the very top there is it creates a direct sale manufacturer license and it's designed specifically for situations like Tesla is. So they have to make sure they're authorized to do warranty work, they can, it only can be on electric vehicles. A dealership can't set up a whole new entity like a Tesla and come in and operate if they've operated as a regular ma or, uh, representative in the franchise law. Uh, there are prohibited things in there. Uh, uh, there's other, pr and that's what uh, through page seven, eight, and nine talk about. On page nine, it talks about the class of dealership. So we put all of the same types of requirements on this direct sales license that there is on any other dealer. Still have to have a bond, you still have to have your insurance, you still have to go through all that rudimentary thing. So they're not operating differently before. We also made sure that the salesman piece of this was good. If you remember from last year and the year before, part of the problem we had was that it allowed their salesman to kind of freelance and do whatever he want. And in my opinion, it kind of license them to be legalized curbers because they could sell out of their house and all sorts of things that they could do. So all of those things have been fixed. Hopefully Tesla will be happy with that. There was a court case. Tesla last year took the state to court, to, to the Utah State Supreme Court. They lost there. We put this, help them put this bill together. So it's kind of like not just kicking in the teeth and sending down the road. We need to come up with a solution because this was a very politically active bill. They wanted to be able to have these types of companies be able to do um, sales and, and service and those kinds of things in our state, which rightly so it is, and we were able to find a fix for them. So there we go. Any questions about that? This will be of interest also that relates to, on the bottom of page 11 is uh, House Bill 474. This is Franchise Act Amendment. We had a new legislator who was appointed just before the session started. Uh, he is from Utah County. He is uh, very libertarian in his thinking that he wants to have government out of everything. So he drafted this bill, and it's kind of complicated to read it, but the bottom line of this says that after June 1st, the franchise bill for new car dealers is repealed, and the franchise law for power sport dealers is repealed. Okay? This bill did not pass. You'll see that we killed this bill. We were able to meet with him, help him understand that. He still doesn't like it, but uh, we all, were also able to convince him that this was not the right thing to do, particularly for the economy and where we're going. Okay? Any questions about uh, some of those new car issues or franchise issues? I know they affect some of us on the, on the used car side as well. On page 12 is transportation governance amendments. You'll see that it says 6SB, that's the sixth substitute, okay? I mean, there were six versions of this bill before it was finally passed. This bill is really important to us because what this does, even from a citizen standpoint and from a motor vehicle issue, is it changes how we're going to fund transportation needs in our state from here on out. 
Before, we used to take about 55% of the, of the money out of general fund, and 45% was taken out of like gas tax and other things that go toward transportation. There's a lot of those, okay? This fundamentally changes things. In the state of Utah, we've been kind of living in a real uh, easy place as it relates to the cost of registration fees. That is going to change. Some people are saying, why is registration the same for my gas car as it is for my electric car? I don't pay gas taxes, so how are they contributing to the road? These are some of the things that are addressed in this new policy by the legislature. If you'll follow through with me, if you look on page 12, it talks about registration fees. It lists in paragraph A, B, and so C, so forth down, it lists all the current registration fees that are there. So like on each motor vehicle, it's $44. Now you're gonna say, well, I'm paying $47.50 or something like that for a car. Isn't that what it is right now? It's about $47.50. How come that's not there? Well, because we have these added on fees that go with, this is the, just the actual registration piece of that. Here's how it's going to change. If you turn over the page on page 13, if you look at, Paragraph H, which is about four or five down, it says, in addition to the fee described, the ones we just looked at, these are the things that are gonna be added to the registration fee, okay, for each electric motor vehicle, and there's a schedule. You're gonna add $60 to the registration if it's an electric vehicle, okay? For 2019, for 2020, it goes up from there, and 2021, it goes up again from there. Same way in a hybrid electric for the next category, for a plug-in hy um, hybrid vehicle, and then for any vehicle not described in there, it also has a list for that, okay? So those fees are gonna be in addition to the registration fees. What does that mean to you as a dealer? One, you need to stay on top of that. As if you're a member of the association, we're gonna help remind you of that. When those fees are going to change, we will help you understand that and know what those are. You're also gonna to have to make a change with your software vendor to make sure those fees, when you punch them in at that time period when they go into effect, then that won't be till January of next year, that will be coming, okay? Um, if you go down to also the bottom of page 14, it says beginning in January 1 of 19, there will be an annual adjustment in the registration fees, not even, and not just including those amounts, but they will look at the CPI. If you look at that, it says that it talks about the consumer price index and zero. That's the range in which those fees can also be added upon. So if the legislature feels like there needs to be more money, they will look at the CPI and somewhere between CPI, the consumer price index, usually that's two, three, four percent, wherever it's gonna end up at. Between that and zero, they can also add to those numbers we just discussed. That's a huge change in what we've been doing. It's something you're gonna have to be um, uh, very careful. One of the things they didn't touch is over on page 15 where it talks about in paragraph three there, uh, first of all, they're gonna round that number to 25 cents, but in paragraph B, vintage vehicles, purple heart uh, plates and campers, those are not going to apply. So veterans and vintage plates, I guess that's for us older guys who may have a collector car or something, I don't know. Uh, those do not change, okay? They also implemented in here a program that allows the state to implement what they called a road user charge program. This is on the bottom of page 15 in paragraph four. What that allows them to do is look at other options for taxation. It allows them, for example, if they wanna to put together a road user plan for mileage. So let's say I drive a little bit of miles and they determine that those miles are less and my registration is gonna be less, I can choose that as opposed to those new registration fees. So a consumer can choose which of the lesser if he wants to pay for that as soon as they get that implemented, okay? And so uh, that will be, it could be mileage, it could be any factor that you wanted to look at or that the legislature wants to look at about how to uh, pay those registration fees. So there's gonna be a lot of options, a lot of changes are gonna go into effect in the next year. Stay tuned, that's why paying a dollar a day for your dues is probably gonna be worthwhile because all you need to do is miss one and you're in trouble, right? Okay, so uh, there you go. Uh, any questions about that? that? That's a big change. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, perfect. If you go to uh, page uh, 16, this is on the, and look at the name, road toll provision. This is not toll roads, it's road toll. This is actually a bill that was, um, that was put together by the president of the Senate. He's a guy that is like third in line in the state down from the governor. Um, this is a, a bill that will go into effect uh, May 8th. What this allows is for toll roads. Do we have any toll roads in Utah right now? 
Come on, don't be chicken. Answer, everybody go like this, we do. What's a toll road? Where do we have toll roads? Interstate. Interstate, right? If you go down, you can pay a, a toll. If I want to be a single driver in the toll lane, or excuse me, in the, in the fast lane, well, it's not always fast, but in that uh, where you have multi, you know, the two, or two plus lane, I can pay that, that's a toll I pay. So Utah already has toll roads in effect, okay? What this does is allow for toll roads. It, it also puts under the Department of Transportation, it adds a big, big change for them in having to administer toll roads. They've never done that. UDOT has always been build roads. Now they've got to be in the administration business because if you are in a toll road and you get cited to be able to do the enforcement, the legislature said, if you get cited for uh, not paying your toll or being a toll road, you get cited, you don't pay it, you have 30 days to pay it, we can hold the registration on your vehicle. Now when this was first written, we were able to have some input in this because if you look at the bottom of the page, and, and let's go down to where it says paragraph five toward the bottom of the page. It says the division may not issue a registration rule for a vehicle if the division has received a hold request which a registration rule has been issued. When that was written, it had to tie to the car and not the person. Can you imagine what that would do is if there was a hold on every vehicle? That means I could go down I-15 and I could just run freely in the HOV lane. I could have $200 worth of toll charges. I trade it into you. Now what happens? You gotta pay those before you can register the vehicle. That's the way it was originally written because we were there and because of our relationship with this, this president of the Senate, we were able, able to change that in the draft form before the bill ever came out. So you'll see all the way through here that has to do with the person who is currently registered on the vehicle. If I have toll violations currently, I have to go solve those. But if I trade it into you, you don't have to pay those for me. Okay? You don't have to pay those for me. Okay? That's another reason why we're there. I already talked about the provisions of this going through in that uh, the ha person has 30 days to be able to do that. Uh, the state can impose a penalty. And the, um, and the other thing that's kind of interesting with this as well is the issue of, if you remember a number about, what, 10 years ago, we had the photocop issue. Those of you who've been here that long. This allows the state and UDOT to use electronic equipment or whatever to enforce this. So as you're going down I-15, if you're not paying and you don't have the transponder, it'll pick up the plate and it'll send you a penalty. If you don't pay it within the days, the UDOT doesn't say how much the penalty is. They can impose the penalty. They're going to decide by rule. Okay, so that's, it won't be a matter of having a police officer there. You're all now going to be on camera. Lucky us, right? Uh, this is one of those nose of the camel issues. You know, it's kind of like as soon as you let the nose of the camel in, the rest of it's sure to follow, right? Okay. Are they planning on expanding toll roads? <clears throat> yes, good question. Are they expanding toll roads? Absolutely. You have the Mountain View Corridor over out way out west. That could be. They're not saying yet. The one, probably the next toll road is going to be up Big Little Cottonwood Canyon because of the traffic problems that are up there. And that was the genesis of this problem. Just so you know, the Senate president lives right at the mouth of the canyon. And on Saturdays and Sundays, he can't even get out his driveway in the early morning because all the traffic's backed up. They're trying to get cars out of the canyon into the park and rides and share and that sort of thing. And so therefore, there will be a toll. We also have a uh, um, canyon up here. Gosh, which one is right up here that you have to stop at the little shack. It's about 33rd South. What's that canyon? Can't remember. Anyway, you have to pay a toll there. So there are some. What is it? Milk Creek. Milk Creek. Thank you. I knew you guys would know. Been a long time since I've been over there. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, let's go to uh, page 18. This has to do with credit freezes. You're going to have customers come in because what's the number one crime in America still? Identity theft, right? People are still on identities. This has to do with credit freezes and consumers who are trying to put credit freezes on their uh, credit with the credit bureaus. Okay. So what this does is uh, takes care of some of those issues that consumers have had with credit freezes. If you go to the bottom of the half of the page, and that goes to the process for the consumer. Here's what a consumer must do in paragraph two at the bottom. A consumer may request a security freeze if they submit the following uh, cert by certified mail, electronic means, or, and being able to provide proper identification. That's what the consumer has to do. None of that's really changed other than it's been put in code. If you turn over to the page to the next page, page 19, in paragraph 2A, this is what the, the uh, credit bureaus have to do, okay? They have to place the credit freeze uh, on the consumer's credit report. The consumer, if the consumer pr uh, submits that and everything is okay and it's not a mobile, uh, so I could get online 
or do something other than my cell phone, then it has, it says that the credit bureau has to put that credit freeze on within 24 hours. If you go down to paragraph C, it says, if the consumer submits the request by mobile application within, how many minutes? You probably don't know on your book because it doesn't have anything, does it? Minutes. It's a test. How many minutes do you think they gave you? 15. So the credit bureau has, if I use my cell phone, I've had my wallet stolen, I've lost it, whatever, within 15 minutes my credit can be frozen. So that's 15, so write that number in there, 15 minutes if you're interested. Then there's one more requirement by the credit bureau that within five business days, they have to report to you that your credit is actually frozen. We've had people who have applied and that hasn't been done, they have problems. So this is a cleanup bill. This was from a constituent who had a problem. Again, somebody who knows their legislator and they come back with a fix, okay? Um, on the bottom page 19 is a uh, seatbelt violation. If you have a seatbelt violation, and this is a one word change, you can see it on page 20 in the second paragraph. Before, if you had a violation, you could go in and plead your case and have the fine waived, but not anymore, you can only have the first one waived. We, they found that there was a lot of repeat offenders that people just didn't put their kids in car seats and so on and so forth, received receive violations. So because there were so many repeat offenders, they said, Sorry, we're not going to waive the fine. Maybe we'll have to make it hurt to get your kids safe. We're only going to waive the first one. After that, you should have learned your lesson. Okay? One word makes a difference. I mean, this is one of many bills where you have to really look at the wording and make sure that it, just, just like we did on the registered vehicle on the, on the toll road. Okay? Auto registration. This is on page 20, uh, House Bill 161. We've been not doing this battle on registrations and whether they should be held in cars or not. Uh, this is one more version of that. I don't know if it's going to change it again next year. Basically what this says, the whole meat of it is in the last paragraph on page 20. It says, for the convenience, not required, but for the convenience of police officer, the owner of the vehicles is, and I love this word, encouraged, sounds like a real legal word, doesn't it? Encouraged to carry the registration and be able to display it. What this bottom line is this, it's not required to have the registration in your vehicle any longer because technology is such now all of the officers have that information on their computer. They can pull up your VIN or your plate or whatever information they have and they can tell you probably more than you know about your car. Okay, So this is no longer do you have to dig into that glove box that has nine million pieces of paper and the officers waiting on the side of the road patiently, right? We've all been guilty of that probably from time to time. <clears throat> Insurance is still required. Um, Oh, excuse me, I take that back. Insurance is not required, you can have it on your phone, but the officer can also verify that. Because a few years ago, I believe that was changed where you don't have to have the insurance on there. Now, let me just give you a helpful tint, hint. Because you as a dealer have to carry insurance as well, we recommend that you carry your insurance with you and just put something like on the back of your dealer plate so you can verify that there's insurance because that piece is not on the police database, that you, what your insurance is. So we still, re even though that's the case, we recommend that you put something or carry something with you that shows that. Okay, uh, the one thing about that that is different also is if you look on page 21 is if you have a rental car, it says that the rental agreement can be the registration. So we have people here are renting cars. You keep that in your glove box. It shows that the vehicle is registered. Okay, the next bill is on sales and use tax exemption. And this bill, I wasn't sure whether I was gonna put it in or not. It's a three word change and it has to do with buying something for resale. And this was kind of obscure, but it still really applied to car dealerships. If you look at paragraph 25 there, it says a product purchased for resale, and you'll see the line through in this state, okay? In the regular course of business, that means it was exempt. So these are sections of the code where there are ex exemptions for resale. We are exempt for resale. So if we go and buy a vehicle from somebody, put it in our inventory at the auction or wherever that is, that is exempt purchase, we don't have to pay tax on that, okay? If that's the case, we, the problem came is, what if it's out of state versus in state? This little obscure piece in here that said in the state. So that meant that anything you bought in the state was exempt, but possibly anything outside the state may not be exempt. Those three words change that, so everything, it just cleans everything up and the practice that you're doing is current the way it is, okay? Questions? Next page. Uh, <clears throat> who has a question? Anybody? Somebody have a question. I've got to get a drink once in a while. License plate bills. 
Here's some changes. Every year we have license plate bills. We have way too many license plates in the state, in my opinion. But on page 22, this goes in, again, this is a January 1 effective date. License plate transfer amendments. This bill was brought by a legislator who said, I love my plate. I love my ski plate or my whatever it was. He said, I want to be able to transfer it. Well, we already have a place, something in place to do that, but it wasn't in the code. So this bill actually says that a person can actually legally transfer their plate. It doesn't have to be a specialty plate. If it is a specialty plate, like an autism or a Boy Scout or a children's plate or whatever the many we have, if you want to transfer that, you have to be current on that fee that you have to pay. pay. So if you have a veteran's plate on there and you're not paying the veteran amount, then you can't transfer that plate. You have to have that current, which means you go back to that entity, pay the fee, and come back. Okay. Um, and interesting enough, this is something that was supposed to be changed on here. If you look at the transfer of ownership and the removal of plates, if you look on the top of page 23, it says if an owner does not transfer a plate to a person as part of the sale, trade, or ownership release vehicle, it says within 20 days you have to, to uh, submit that to the, to, the ta to the DMV, to the division. How many people send their plates to the DMV for destruction? Like probably this many, but that's what the code says. They were supposed to fix this, but it didn't get fixed, okay? And it wasn't a big deal, so anyway. Uh, if the owner transfers the plate, it's actually the owner's responsibility, but you as the dealer, if you're selling him something and want to help him, you can. But we put the responsibility on the owner, not the dealer. So if you didn't transfer it, there's no penalty. It's totally on the person transferring that. Okay? Questions about that? One of the plates on bottom page 23 is a manufacturer plate. Like I said, there's a plate for everything. This is the one I put in here because we just fixed it. If you turn the page, it talks about what you can use a manufacturer plate for, and it says there in paragraph three, about a third of the way down, it says it can, manufacturer can use it to deliver a motor vehicle to a dealer. They can um, they can demonstrate to a dealer or protect or prospective dealer or conduct manufacturer tests. One of the things that was included in here originally was to be able to have consumers them to use it for consumers to test drive. We said nope, that dog don't hunt. Okay. We took that out, so these are, again, clarifies the provisions of what a manufacturer can uh, use that plate for. We still included in here a reminder for you on transporter plates, because people still have a misunderstanding on transporter plates. Transporter plates are from A to B and B to A. Don't put it on your wife's car for her to drive to go to the grocery store. She'll get it impounded and she will be mad. Okay? The second part of that is on dealer plates. People say, well, what can we use a dealer plate for? It's what can't you use it for, and it specifies that in paragraph 5 at the bottom of the page. It says dealer plates may, may not be used on a leased or rented vehicle, so you can't take a vehicle out of your fleet and say, I'm going to rent this to my neighbor for the weekend, I'll throw a dealer plate on. And that brings insurance issues into it to play, by the way, if you did. Number two is in lieu of registration. Dang, I can't get that title out of California. I'll just give him a dealer plate until it gets here. Doesn't work. Okay, that's in lieu of an example of in lieu of registration, or on a loaded motor vehicle over 12,000 pounds. Now, that one I think is going to have some discussion this year because we're looking at that and say, why not? Why do we have to go through all this process? I don't know what the answer to that is. Why do we need something special if somebody wants to put the truck camper on or pull a boat or whatever the case may be? We're going to find that out and see if that's something. So, by maybe by this time next year, we'll have two things that you can't use it for. If, somebody, if any police officer says, oh, you can't use it for personal use, or you, can't, you only can use it during business times, those are not true, okay? If you hear those things, please call me, because that's the only way we can fix it. Hey, you know, the Davis County Sheriff's Office says, blah, blah, blah. I can call motor vehicle enforcement, they can call the police chief and get that taken care of. A lot of times, it's particularly from new police officers that just came out of the academy that sometimes don't know all those things, okay? Nothing against them, okay? The action item on the top of page 25 is, Please help officers with your place. Don't put them on your front dash. They have to go in the rear of the vehicle, clearly visible, okay, and securely attached, okay. If you, can you, that means can you wedge it in the brake light in the back? Sure, as long as the window's not tinted and you can still see it, right? And it's horizontal position and clearly visible. It meets the criteria. But if it's sitting on your dash or in your briefcase in the back seat, law enforcement's going to pull you over because they're always looking for stolen cars, and those are typically ones without plates, okay. Questions on that? On page um, 25 is the special support group plate for motorcycles. They want a specialty plate for that. And then on page 20, let's see, did I miss one? Nope, I didn't. Uh, page 26 is the special support for historical plate. 
Some of you are probably in this room old enough to remember the old plates that were black back in the 650s and 60s, or black had white letters and said Utah on them. That plate's coming back. The problem that the DMV has had is that um, the law requires it to be reflective paint and to get reflective paint in black is problematic. When you put the reflection on it, it turns purple. And so they've directed the enforcement or the uh, DMV to find out what materials they can use and to come up with a historical plate. And that's been support and that plate will be supported to support the historical society, okay? One more that's brand new is the women's suffrage plate. I don't know who's gonna be on that. Is it gonna be Susan B. Anthony? I don't know, make your bet, see who that's gonna be. I don't know. I still like the uh, provisions that uh, one of the former directors of the tax commission said is, I think with all the specialty plates, what we ought to do is if they want a specialty plate, you issue the plate where the decal goes and hand them a red and a blue Sharpie and let them write whatever the heck they want in there. As long as it's not obscene or offensive, let your grandkids draw flowers in there. Who cares, right? So there you go. All I know is we have way too many decals in our drawers downstairs. Keep track of, okay? Any questions on the, de on the plates and dealer plate use? Okay, perfect. Page 28, we're gonna talk, start talking about emissions. Emissions has been a very high priority for legislators because we do all know we need to clean up our air. The question is how do we do it and that we do it effectively. We don't want just to pass stuff to pass stuff, okay? This uh, goes into effect in May 8th, but it also talks about, in the first part is existing code where it talks about what's exempt from emissions like farm trucks, vintage vehicles, custom vehicles, vehicles that are less than two years old. Remember the chart you have of what years have emission testing. So two years are exempt. And then on page 29 is motorcycles and electric powered vehicles, vehicles that are 1967 and older. Those are all exempt from emission testing. What the state has dictated in this legislation that says a county, and this would be the five emission counties, shall, they have to put together a diesel emissions program beginning, if you look at the date in paragraph seven, um, uh, they have to start, uh, if they don't have a program by December 31st of 2017, which has already passed, then they have to implement a three-year pilot program. That pilot program is for the inspection of diesels. It's for a model year of uh, 2007 or newer. They put the parameters in here of what is going to be required. This will all be further dictated by the county in which the emissions program is gonna be set up. There's also a, on page 30, there's a visual inspection that can be done for certain vehicles. So you're gonna have a mechanical inspection as well as a visual inspection. But the also, the uh, person, or excuse me, the county has to also make a report, that's on page 30. They have to report to the legislature their pass-fail rates of the, both the visual and mechanical inspection, how many total vehicles they did, and they have to present a report at the end of this three-year period. In fact, the report even has to, as it says on page 31, talk about the tons of pollution that that program actually saved. And that could be interesting to see what that number looks like as we go forward, okay? On page 31, a bill that didn't pass, this was uh, said that any repeat offenders had to be reported to the motor vehicle division and that their licensure could be suspended, okay? On page uh, 32, our power sport bills. These are the fun stuff we all like to use, okay? A lot of you sell that. These are power sport bills. This, is, this first one has to do with street legal issues, okay? It says this has to do with where you can operate a street legal. If you remember last year we talked about a county of the first class, meaning Salt Lake County, there were certain restrictions that they could still impose, such as if they put a sign or designated a street. There's still requirements in there that say it has to be on a road that's uh, more than 50 miles an hour, so you can't ride it on an interstate. Those sorts of things all stay into place. But if you look at the bottom, page 32 and the top of 33, it took out those provisions that the county can't just put out signs or just say arbitrarily, we're not gonna allow ATVs on this road. Okay, that means for the most part, you can use a side-by-side -side pretty much anywhere in, in the state of Utah with those restrictions, again, of not on interstate and so on and so forth. Okay, questions about that? We see a lot of those around now. On page 33 is off-highway vehicle amendments. This has to do with registration against the age-based fee issue. If you look at the chart there, it says the age of, and you'll see an all-terrain vehicle, so ATVs, other motorcycles, or snowmobiles. You see everything is struck out except for snowmobiles. This now becomes the new chart for snowmobiles. So if you sell a snowmobile, you're gonna look at the age again, not the value. 
Okay, and then there's also, and what there is on the pa bottom page it says, for an all-terrain vehicle that's not a street legal, there's also a new fee schedule that's on the next page. And, there's, and now there's a fee schedule specifically for ATVs and motorcycles. You'll see underneath that is the street legal chart. If you look at those numbers and compare them to what they were, that's an age-based tax reduction. Those numbers went down for those two categories you're looking at on page 34. So we're actually able to reduce the uh, age-based fees on that. Sports vehicle modification, this has to do with changing definitions. In definitions, we had a class of class one, class two, and then they had two other designations, a full-sized ATV and a, and a utility ATV. Those two terms went away, it's now class one, two, and three, okay, on those types of things. So they went through on page, uh, 35 and they went through and gave definitions for what those are. We worked with the manufacturers on what that is. If you look at page 36, it gives an all-terrain uh, vehicle type two, and also by the way applies to three as you read on later, but type two and three can now be 80 inches wide. We, we worked with the manufacturers on that so some of the future vehicles they have coming up can now still be uh, ridden out on, the, uh, out on the roads, okay? Any questions about that? Perfect. Um, page 38. Sorry, my book just fell apart, so I've got to fumble here a little bit. Get that put back together, the back broke. So, business bills. We actually belong to a business coalition group on Capitol Hill. It's made up of associations like ours, professional and trade associations. And so when issues come up like workers' comp and insurance and other business bills, we all get together and we tackle those collectively as a business community, okay? This bill was one of those bills, and this bill did not pass. And it's a good thing if you read the third paragraph in that bill, it says this bill would have created a new liability for individuals and businesses. It would potentially make businesses, or excuse me, business owners, CEOs, COOs, employers, homeowners, property owners, churches, and even parents and these are the important words, jointly and severably liable with a bad actor on their property. That means if somebody comes into your property and they're a bad actor, they vandalize, they, you know, there's a fight, there's whatever. All of those categories that we mention are joint and severably. That means they consume jointly all together as well as you individually for that because some guy came in and did a bad thing, okay? We were able to kill that. Guess who brought that bill to the legislature? Trial attorneys, right? It's not hard to figure out. By the way, they're not, trial attorneys association is part of our group, just so you know, okay? So that's something that probably in and of itself probably saved you guys somewhere between $1,000 and $1,200 a year just on your insurance to cover that. Now our dues paid for for the year for all of you? Yeah, should be pretty easy to write that $325 check today, right? Okay, there you go. I'm not going to go through some of the bills that didn't pass that we watched, um, but the one thing on there, I, right in the middle, is a bill, uh, 337, uniform fee in lieu of, uh, that was an age-based fee. We had a legislator who said, hey, why should I pay the age-based fee multiple times? So if I know that the person that owned that before me paid that, why should I have to pay it again? Can you imagine having to go back and look at every vehicle that you're going to sell to see if the age base, it kind of retros us back to the mess we had before cars were changed, right? So we were able to kill that. A couple of federal issues for you, okay? Some of these federal issues are really important. How many of you knew we had a new one of these? Buyer's Guide. If you don't, you better throw your old ones away and make sure you have the new ones. Here's the difference, okay? On here, it's still selling as is or with a warranty, okay? It still has place, if you're gonna offer a warranty, where to put that. But down here now, instead of having, if the vehicle has remaining factory warranty, you don't have to go figure out what it is and write it all in here. You check a box and say, go check with the manufacturer. But it does have remaining factory warranty. So that takes a huge liability off here. One of the big things on, and there's a couple of other things, but um, a couple of things that you will want to pay attention to, and that is, it allows the person to still inspect the vehicle, but you can determine where that happens. We've had a lot of problems, particularly back east, where people have been taking cars, they take them to their mechanic, mechanic tears it down, and they don't put it back together. Whose fault, okay? Now on the buyer's guide it says, it's your responsibility to determine who. So if you don't want that person to, you can say. They don't have a right to do that anymore. Second of all, it also talks here about open safety recalls. Safety recalls are gonna be a big deal coming up. You can see from the 
do the stop order and that sort of thing that they're coming up if there's recalls on vehicles. That's really going to affect the used car industry coming up. On there, it tells them they should have a safety recall, um, uh, ask about safety recalls. So now, how do we do that as dealers? One of the things that we will have available on our goal date is June 1st, is we are going to have a new form, just waiting is another new form, but this is going to be to protect you that, and I don't hold me to these words, but it'll basically the concept is, Mr. Consumer, there may or may not be a recall on this vehicle. If there is, you need to contact the manufacturer who will work with the dealer to solve any safety recall issue that you may have. Does that totally protect us and take us out of the loop of lawsuit? No, it doesn't, but it mitigates and lessens the liability that we inform the consumer that there may or may not be a recall on this vehicle. Some people are suggesting that you go to the safercar.gov website and print out that particular vehicle and give it to the customer so they do know whether it is or isn't. That's a business practice you have to decide for yourself. But we want to make sure that there's some kind of a disclosure for you as a dealer to inform that customer, especially now that it's on the buyer's guide, that you have a safety recall policy. Okay? Questions about that? Make sure you're doing that. Okay? Uh, let's see here. On page uh, 40 is a new rule for uh, military people. Okay? If you're doing financing, this will mostly apply to those of you who buy here, pay here. If you're doing financing for military, there's a new Federal Military Finance Act. That means that you have to determine as a dealer if that person or their spouse or immediate family member, son, daughter, whatever, is if their parents are on active duty. If they are, then there's a whole new set of rules that come into play. There's caps on how much you can charge them. There's restrictions on what you can and cannot finance. So can you finance GAP and all those other things we tr traditionally do? The answer is some of them yes, some of them no. In this piece that I put together, actually I can't take credit for that, our National Association attorney put this together. Your homework assignment today, doesn't every class have homework, right? Did when I went to school. Okay, so your assignment today is go back and read this. It's a narrative by our National Association attorney, Sean Peterson. And part of the problem is that Congress passed this new military law, which I agree we need to protect our military, but there are some things that need to be fixed in it it's because there are some things that we should be able to finance for military people that can help them, such as GAP, those non-finance related type uh, process. Okay? There will be, there also in our last edition of the used car dealer magazine, there was a big write-up in there too, so there's a lot more detail information for that as well. <clears throat> okay? Um, the last part of this is some pieces from motor vehicle enforcement. One of the things that we put in our class is that all of you from time to time are going to have a motor vehicle enforcement officer show up at your door. How do we make this easy, especially for you, but especially for them? If we make it easy for them, they're not staying as long, right? It's kind of like, here's your hat, what's your hurry, right? Okay, got you done, let's go. So these are some things that we've worked with the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division on. And I, and I take my hat off to the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division. We have a new director, new relative is, over the last year or so. Uh, Alan Shinney has been absolutely fabulous to work with. He is very pro-business. You will notice one of the changes he made is that when they come into your office, they don't carry their sidearms anymore, they don't carry their guns. Okay? That's the first thing they've done because they want to be business friendly. If you look at the origination of the Motor Vehicle Enforcement Division, it was actually called Motor Vehicle Business Administration. That's what it was originally when we first started that back when I first started 40 years ago. That's what it was. Okay? So we have seen a huge change in that for um, their efforts in helping us be in compliance because their goal is not to cite you. Their goal is to keep you in compliance. And that's what our goal is too. We want everybody make sure they're doing things the way they are because the ones that don't are the ones that cause all of us problems. Okay? So here's a list. Temporary permits, they're always a problem. Okay? A couple of things to be remember is make sure that you have a log to track that. You can use the uh, state log. You can do your own Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't matter. Temporary permit log. Keep it up to date. Okay? Make sure when you do titling process, you put the plate number that corresponds with the temporary permit, right? Okay? So make sure you're tracking all of that. Okay? On your temporary permits also, we're seeing from the DMV side, Many of you on your temporary permits are not writing on the permit the issue date and the expiration date. You need to do that. The, the, the enforcement division says they're going to start assessing a penalty if you're not writing that stuff in. Okay? 
So make sure you write those uh, um, on the registration part. Doc fees, you're all familiar with doc fee. Do you have to charge a doc fee? The answer is no. Okay, if you do charge a doc fee, you have to display that. The officer's gonna look for a sign like this. It doesn't have to be this size. I've made it this size so you could read it. Basically, you're gonna put your fee in there, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, and we're not gonna talk about what that is, but it talks about costs and, pro this is relative to costs and profit for the dealer. Because of recent court cases that were just settled, we are looking at working with the tax commission for a rule change to take out the word and profit because the courts have determined that the doc fee have to be specifically related to documentation. You can't just arbitrarily make it whatever you like. It has to be specifically related to that. If, in fact, you want to find out what your doc fee should be, the association has actually developed a flow chart, an Excel sell spreadsheet that you can go through and populate the pieces in there based on what you're doing in your dealership, and you can determine what your doc fee is and what your actual costs are. From a business standpoint, not a law, but a business standpoint, I'd probably like to know what that is. is. Is my doc fee enough or is it too much or where does it really fall? So why not do that just out of a good business practice? But again, the and profit side more than likely will come out. Now, that's not in place right now, although there's been pending court cases. When this change happens, we will let you know because more than likely it'll change two words and take out and profit in here. So stay tuned on that one. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next one is on financial disclosure. You all know what the financial disclosure is. This is our copyright motor vehicle contract to sell. The financial disclosure is down the right hand side. You have to have them sign either section A or B. They will look to see if those are signed. They'll have you pull out maybe a half a dozen contracts to make sure those are signed properly as to who is responsible for financing. If it's A, it's the customer. If it's B, it's you who is responsible. You never have them sign both. I'll just have them sign both, so if they can't get it, I can get it. That's not what does. Part B allows you to do that, but don't have them sign both. We've also seen some contracts that people have put their own contract together. The statute says this is required on the first page, the front of the contract. So if you're doing something different than that, make sure it's, it's in compliance. And it has to have this exact wording in here. The exact words from there, top to bottom, are in statute. Okay, So make sure that that financial disclosure is done properly. Okay, um, the next one is on, and I'm page 44, is on wholesale transactions. The state is always looking for wholesale deals because sometimes they go in and the dealer's taken a consignment of cars from another dealer or they have bought them, they don't know what they are. Make sure if you're buying cars from another dealer, you use some kind of a wholesale transaction form. It does a lot of things for you. One, it shows the enforcement guys that you actually own the car, but two, that you are going to be exempt from the sales tax. I always know when somebody's getting a sales tax audit because they call me and says, Wayne, is there a list that lists all the dealer's tax ID numbers? And the answer is, no, there's not. Okay? So they had to go back to all those dealers and get their tax ID number because the state requires that to be done. If you're buying cars from somebody, make sure that gets on there. If you're using the same dealer to buy or sell cars to, you're going to have their number, but get it on, on the contract that's there. That'll save you a ton of heartache when you have to do... Um, when you have to do um, audits for your sales tax. Next one is on consignments. Make sure there's some kind of consignment agreement in place. Um, let's see, make sure I don't miss one. Okay, this is the uh, foreign uh, vehicle disclosure form. I fond fondly call it the Canadian vehicle disclosure because that's about 98% of the cars that are out there. Statute requires if you're selling a vehicle that was manufactured outside the US, to disclose that. The state will be looking for that. So they may ask, do you have any Canadian vehicles you sold? Yes, I did. Pull one of the deal jackets out. I want to make sure you're doing the disclosure. This should be, the statute says any person who sells a vehicle should be filling one of these out. It does three disclosures. It says one, the vehicle meets US safety standards. Two, that the odometer has been changed from kilometers to miles. And three, that there may or may not be warranty left on this vehicle. That's all it discloses, but you have to have it by law. This goes in your deal jacket. You don't turn it in anybody. Who's going to check it? Motor vehicle enforcement. This is uh, tax commission form number 353, if you're interested. TC 353, you can get them online. If you want multiple copies to get one for your customer, one for you, we have these printed in duplicate for you. Okay. This, I will also encourage you because every person has to do this disclosure. If somebody's trading in a vehicle that is a Canadian vehicle to you, have them fill this out as a disclosure from them to you, then you're going to disclose it to your new customers so you have a clean paper trail in and out. 
okay? That's what the state people are going to be looking for, okay? The next one is on salvage disclosure. Are you all familiar with this? If you have a branded vehicle, it doesn't have to say salvage on it, it just says if it has a brand. It says, and this is by the way, TC814 form, this says that if the vehicle has a brand, doesn't matter the age, year, kind, size, model, whatever, the title has a brand, this, has to, this form has to be displayed on the lower left-hand corner of the window as you face the car, lower left-hand window. Okay? They will look at those and ask you about salvage vehicles. So this form also, and this is a tax commission form, and actually you can order these out of the warehouse because this is the only form that the state prints in multiple part copy, but you can also print it off online and put a single copy in your window. Okay, questions? Yeah, Go. Form number? form number again is TC. Anything that starts in a form with TC is a tax commission form. So TC 814, 814. Okay, licensing and titling. What's your title every time in the state of Utah for a title? There's three of them, right? We put a 45 day permit on there, right? So you have 45 days to deliver title on a retail transaction. I will give you a heads up on that, that if you're doing, if the customer is doing financing for the financial institution, whether it be you or a bank, in order to have bankruptcy protection, that title has to be processed within 30 days, even though our state gives you 45. So even though it says 45, you might want to look at that. Second one is title delivery time is what? Wholesale transactions. What's the title delivery time on wholesale? 21. 21. That's what the auctions do, right? That's why it's 21 days they give you to deliver title. 21 days. What's the last one? 48 hours. What does that apply to? That applies that if you don't put a temporary permit on the vehicle, you have 48 hours to deliver title. Okay. So there's your three title delivery times, okay? Uh, sales tax. Sales tax is a heads up because of all the different tax changes that are going on. You'll see a lot of local taxes that are being implemented. We suggest at least quarterly, you can do it earlier, but you go quarterly to the website of tax.utah.gov and go to the sales tax piece and you can look up where your dealership is and what your sales tax rate is, okay? Make sure you're charging the right rate. If, if you've been charging 685 and it went up by a quarter percent to 705, guess who gets to pay that? You can't go back to your customer and collect it. You get to pay it. So make sure it's correct. Those can change just about any time. So if a city decides they're going to do a ZAP tax and implement a zoo, arts, and parks tax, you better make sure that you find out what that is. A lot of times they send that out, but sometimes they're not very good at it too. And it's your responsibility to make sure that it is correct. Okay? Dealer plates, it talks about dealer plates. Again, it's mostly the positioning of that. Dealer plates should be on the rear of the vehicle, horizontal position, securely attached. We already talked about that uh, when we talked about the other issue. Test drives, test drives is still a problem. Make sure you have some kind of a test drive agreement in place, okay? You are required under almost every insurance contract that we've heard of or seen requires you to protect your asset. How do you protect the asset if you don't put something together to make sure the person who's driving the car is who it is, okay? Or that they have insurance, or how long the car is gonna be gone. That's a typical one. I go into the dealership and you say, yeah, I'll go to the chest drive, oh, we'll see you in a few minutes. I take off for the weekend, oh, by the way, it's only Thursday, take off for the weekend, go to Vegas, come back, you've reported the car stolen, right? You, I go pulling in Monday morning with the car, you call the sheriff, he comes over here, can he arrest you? Well, he can, but more than likely he's not going to because you don't have any documentation that said when that bring the vehicle back. He said, well, he told me I could bring it back Monday and take it over the weekend. And you said, oh, no, I said I'd see you in a few minutes. He said, she said, does not work. Make sure he has some kind of a test drive agreement in place for that. Okay? Uh, and then on your records, okay, make sure that you are protecting your records. How long do you have to keep your records? Minimum. Minimum. Five years. Why? Odometer disclosure. Okay? Even if your accountant says, oh, you only keep them three. Nope. Five years for odometer disclosure. Some uh, are recommending longer, okay? But make sure you keep those records. That's, and you need to keep those on site so when the enforcement guys come in, you can get them in and get them out. Hey, we need this car that you sold in January. What was the mileage or was the title branded or whatever question they're gonna ask. Be able to pull that out, keep all your stuff organized in your deal jacks, show them that the, here's what it is, here's how we bought it in, here's how we sold it out. Make sure that that's in place, okay? Yes? If there is no odometer, do we have to abide by the five years? 
Um, no. Unless there's some, some, and again, I don't know what you're doing in your business, but odometers is specific to five years. So that would be based on what you're doing individually, consult your finance people or your CPA. So yeah, yep. Okay, no odometer, okay. Uh, the next one is on freight and destination charges. There's been questions because some dealers have been charging freight and putting that as a line item in their contract. Let me just give you two points of interest that the state's looking for on freight charges. Freight, when you advertise it, if you advertise freight on a car, or excuse me, a price on a car, if you're advertising that vehicle for $4,500 and 500 of that is freight, that has to be included in the price of the vehicle. When you get back to the dealership, if you want to put the price of the vehicle on your motor vehicle contract as so you can keep track of all this and put the purchase price as $4,000 and put a line item of $500, you can do that, but just make sure advertising and your practice are working together to make sure they are the same, okay? The next one is, uh, one of the last ones there is on the uh, audit thing is the um, um, implied warranty. What's an implied warranty? I bet about any amount of money you want that during the last week somebody's come in and you've implied a warranty. Most common one is what? How many miles the gallon will this car get? Okay. Well, manufacturer says get 20 on the road. What did you just do? You implied a warranty. Will this truck pull my trailer? Sure it will. We've had an actual court case. You guys in my class use the white truck thing where the guy burns up the truck and brings it back. This is not under motor vehicle code. This is under the Department of Commerce that on implied warranty. Commerce says if you're going to imply a warranty, it has to be in writing. Okay? This form has saved a lot of dealers in court because what they, this form does is said we have not promised anything as far as it relates to fit for a particular purpose or that it will do certain things or it's going to get that 20 miles a gallon. This says anything that we promise, we put in writing. And that's what the law under the Department of Commerce covers. Now, Commerce isn't going to come and enforce that in your dealership. Where this is going to be enforced is in front of the judge. Mr. Judge, we didn't put any, everything that we said about this vehicle, we put in writing. If you're not using this form, and this is one of our IDS forms, uh, it is form number 187-2. If you're not using this form or something that will accomplish the same thing, you need to do this on every single vehicle that you do for your protection. What's the difference between that and, where did my buyer's guide go? Right, somewhere. There it is. What's the difference between these two? Sorry. This is a federal form, this is a state form. Well, what's the difference? This one just says how I'm gonna sell it, as is or with warranty. It has nothing to do with implied warranty and fit for a particular purpose. This is how we sell it. This meets the federal law. It has the known defects on the back, has a place for the customer to sign. Make sure you're having the customer sign. It's not required. But when you get in front of the judge, you say, Mr. Jones, did you explain this? Sure I did. Not only did I explain it, but I have them sign it. Okay? Now this is an NCR form, so make sure the copy you give them is not the one they signed. Make sure you keep the one that's signed. Okay? What about implied warranty? These two work together, not one in place of the other. This one is as important as this one, even though this has probably a higher penalty, possibly, because this is a thousand dollar a thousand dollar fine plus administrative, or ten thousand dollar fine plus a thousand dollar administrative fine for not, gosh, for not doing this for I'm Sorry. Okay. Questions about these two and what they do? No. The uh, we looked at that actually. Can we do it on one form? Because I'd I'd rather have one form. The problem is the feds are very specific. You can't even add a watermark or additional information. It has to be a certain type size with certain kind of ink on paper and so on and so forth. So yeah, we've looked at that. We've tried. We tried. Okay. A couple last things um, we wanted to bring to your attention. Okay. Uh, let me just give you a couple helpful hints of things that are being missed with mo on motor vehicle paperwork. One is make sure the odometer is on reassignments. You know, you get subsequent reassignments, you get your title, and then subsequent reassignments. A lot of times the mileage may not change, and you forget to write in the mileage. Make sure that that's done. Please make sure your title work is legi legible. My title clerks say, yeah, we're like pharmacists, so we can read about anything. Well, if you can read doctor writing, why can't you read this? Well, please help them out. Make sure that things are legible. Uh, make sure when you have somebody that has a mailing address that's different from a physical address, make sure the physical address is in there. It can't just be a P.O. box. We're seeing that recur all the time, okay? And then also the thing that's always missed is 
in the old days when there just used to be an arches and a ski plate. Remember those days? And if you didn't check it off, the plate was just going to give you the ski plate. And if you don't like it, tough. Right? Now we have three of them. Okay? We have the arches, we have the ski, we have the in God we trust. If, if, the state, if you were going to take them to the state, they'll reject them. But it does cause our office additional time because we've got to call you. Which plate do you want? you want the in God we trust? Do you want the ski plate? What do you want? So make sure that you're checking that box and making sure that uh, those are checked off. Last item is on safety inspection. Do we have a safety inspection program in Utah? Our big go like this, because we still do. Not required as a point of registration anymore, right? We don't have to show a document that shows safety inspect anymore, but there are certain vehicles that are still required to have a safety inspection. What are they? Street legal ATVs, if they go from an off highway to street legal, require a safety inspection. Okay, what else? Transportation, school buses, public transportation. If you sell a bus to the autism school that's right out here in front next to us, and they're gonna use that for commercial and for hauling their kids around, does it need a safety inspection every year? Yes, it does, okay? Uh, there are still things that between the tax commission and the Department of Public Safety are working out on processes for those. If you're selling a car to a guy that's gonna be an Uber driver, does he have to have safety inspection? The answer is yes, yeah, public transportation is still on there. Trucks are still on there, okay? Some have asked, can we put safety inspection back on? The legislature has no flavor whatsoever or wanting to address safety inspection, okay? Unfortunately, I talked to a highway patrolman at the Capitol during these snowstorms we had while the session was going on. I said, so have you seen any impacts on safety inspection? He said, you know what the biggest one is? Everybody can get through the snow. Typically, the people who slide off are people who have bad tires. So we're seeing those impacts. You may start seeing more vehicles that are rougher condition. Checking with the repair shops, you know what I'm hearing from them? Less work orders, higher cost to fix because people are now going through brakes and rotors and all those things. So yes, there was an impact in many of the things that uh, we already talked about, okay? Uh, let's see, what else did I miss? Who has questions for me? Any questions? Come on, you gotta have some. That was a lot to digest through. How do we do for time? Pretty close, an hour and 15, 20 minutes, okay? Great, please do this. When you go back to your dealership, make sure you tell whoever's there about the things we talk about. Because it's kind of great, you know, you go to a conference and you hear all this good stuff, and you think, oh good, I can make my business better. What's our tendency? We go back and do the same thing we've been doing that we did yesterday, right? Implement changes. Safety inspection could be a good thing for you guys. I mean, if, if I was doing this, and I'm not, but if I was, that would probably be a good promotion piece for me that, hey, we still safety, it doesn't matter whether you have a nine point or a 90 point or a 900 point inspection, does it? It doesn't, okay? But you're doing something to help your consumer, okay? So it might be a good thing to look at. What about a rental or leased vehicle? Do they have to do safety? Um, now you're testing me, I can't remember. I'm gonna to have to look and tell you. I'd rather look and, and tell you rather than tell you something wrong, okay? So I don't know that. I'll look that up and I'll let you know. It'll only take me a minute if you wanna hang on. If any of you have questions, you're welcome to stay after and have any questions. Uh, thank you for being here today, thanks.